coming up next on CBS Sports, the NCAA Basketball Championship. It's Gary Parrish. Welcome back. I own college basketball podcast where we sometimes discuss camel fighting dodo birds and leaky black. The own college basketball podcast is, of course, presented by Jersey Mike's Jersey Mike's a sub above. Matt Norlander is here with me. We're in different rooms in the same hotel. Uh, about 13 hours after we last talked to you on the Ion College <laughs> basketball podcast, we're back. With Monday's national title game now set for tomorrow night, State Farm Stadium, Glendale, Arizona. It'll be UConn against Purdue. Norlander, um, uh, I haven't seen you in like six hours. How you been over the Yeah, past that is that is true. After the pod we did, uh, we did convene here in the hotel lobby with uh, a lot of our CBS and HQ colleagues. That was a lot of fun. Got to bed late. Oh, man, look at the eyes there. Doing all right, oh, actually. Buddy. Yeah, yeah. Man, Go, we're going to have to get some – I hope I hope Mina's ready for me over at the CBS Sports Network set because we're gonna need some special special stuff underneath here. You no doubt about it. But if you if you're if you're dialing in live, uh, hello hello. Not a toss up that uh, we'll toss up the same poll. I remember the, the the numbers from last night. I'll share it at the end of the show. But who are you picking to win the title game? And we uh, we gave you a reaction Saturday from the stadium. Now we turn and we'll give you a preview here. This is going to be a quickie one. We're going to try and get out of here relatively fast. And then we will have a Monday show on CBS Sports Network live on television. And that one, again, as the other ones have, uh, will go into the YouTube channel and also into the pod feed. So you're going to get two preview episodes. This one, we hope, will be at least a little bit different from whatever we wind up talking about tomorrow. But it's one game, two teams, same players, et cetera, et cetera. Where do you want to start, GP? Well, um, it's interesting because I, I we're going to pick the game later. I, I think people who listen to this podcast already know where I'm going. I can't give up now. I can't give up now. But um, I will say that as I go through it, I was sort of chuckling at myself this morning because um, uh, our wonderful boss, Adam Silverstein, he's, he's got a, a – uh, you know, picks uh, piece uh, that he's putting together right. and you have to, you know, who you pick in uh, against the spread. And then, you know, write a couple paragraphs about why. And so as I'm writing it, I'm like, OK, let's look at this. UConn is more efficient offensively than Purdue. UConn is more efficiently efficient defensively than Purdue. UConn is ahead of Purdue and all of the computers. Um UConn has more future NBA players than Purdue on the perimeter. UConn is bigger and more athletic and than Purdue. This is, I, I'm saying this sincerely. This is the exact type of thing I would never pick against. That's correct. <laughs> you in, in any other universe, you would you would hear me go, what are you even looking at? All right. Like, like we're, it, all the data is in front of you. <laughs> and it says this team's better offensively. This team's better defensively. This team's got more future pros. This team's uh, bigger and more athletic on the perimeter. What are we talking about? And so yeah, I, I know. I know where we're at. I had some UConn fans last night uh, come up and they were like, GP, it's not too late. <laughs> you can, it's not too late. You can you can be on the right side of history. Yeah, it's not too late. Um, but I'm, I'm going to see it through. But I, I feel like that was a, a, a reasonable place to start the conversation. I know what we're looking at. I, and I understand why UConn is a at least opened as a six and a half point favor. We'll see where the line settles. Yeah. But let me ask you this. Okay. Obviously, we all have Ken Palm subscriptions. Um, that projected margin is three. That's a big jump. We look at this stuff every day for five months a year. That's a yeah. big jump from where, say, Ken Palm would just have it without an obvious injury situation or something like that. Are you surprised the betting markets moved that number? So, like, three and a half points away from Ken Palm is a pretty significant move. It is a significant move. Um, it's it's closer than I thought it would be, honestly. Um, but I, again, when we said that when we talked about this late on the Saturday night show, I just anticipated the number would be uh, bigger for the betting markets. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's and it speaks to produce capabilities and having the best player in the country. Adjusted efficiency margin is not close, though, GP. Uh, UConn's adjusted efficiency margin is 35.65. Uh, Purdue is number two in the country at 31.31. That's 4.34 difference. So the difference between UConn and Purdue right now is greater than the difference between Purdue at number two 
And I think it's down to, it might be boo, 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 Illinois at 10. If not, it could be Creighton at 11, all the way down there in terms of adjusted efficiency margin. So um, they, you kind of separate itself. I, I do admire you for going down. Maybe going, you might, <laughs> hey, listen, this might be an amazing, amazing uh, podcast recap on Monday night. Um, it will be amazing either way. Uh, that's my biggest thing about this game is that we are getting, we are guaranteed an epic ending. We just are. We're either getting Purdue actually beating UConn and do, and pulling a Virginia and so much more. I don't want to just always, you know, reduce it to the Virginia thing, but we get that or we get UConn back-to-back champs in any way they get there is great. Uh, but if they were to do it and beat another team by double digits, well, then they, they have a, a real case of being one of the best teams of the past, say 50 years. And I think, I think we, I think we've got a chance at a healthy, close game, but I think it's got to be more than just uh, than just Zach Eady going off. I think if Zach Eady gives a uh, gives Purdue twenty eight, actually, let me give you let me give you the averages here. It's in my column from overnight. Let's we might as well also actually I'll save it for the end. We'll do we'll do Zach Eady over under combined points and rebounds, but it can't just be him. I think you're going to need Lance Jones to show up well again. He he did well on defense. He provided I think fourteen points for Purdue. Uh, against NC State, Fletcher Lawyer, Braden Smith. I think Purdue probably needs to play an A game, A minus maybe, but then UConn would have to have an abnormally bad game uh, in order to keep this one close. And I do think, and take it wherever you want, GP, I do think we'll have more Purdue in the building than we will have UConn. Uh, They're both going to show up heavy, enthusiastic, uh, but because Purdue is a bigger school, and because it has a wider alumni base that spreads out ar- across the country, um, I expect to just what I saw we saw in the building on Saturday night. I think that Purdue will have more fans there. I don't think that's going to necessarily give them the edge in uh, winning the game, but I can't wait to to be back there on Monday night. Something you touched on is uh, among my favorite things about this national championship game. I, I think my favorite thing is is simply that we have the best two teams. With all due respect to Houston, and let, let's keep in mind that. Even if Houston would have won the game that it lost in this NCAA tournament, I think most of us are operating with an understanding that Jamal Shedd was not coming back. I mean, you, you like he, he was it wasn't like he's gonna play two days later. So eventually that was gonna catch up with Houston, and Houston minus Jamal Shedd is not one of the best two teams in the country. But Purdue and UConn, as currently constructed, they are the two best teams in the country. Dan Hurley called them the two best teams in the country for the past two years. I know some people can dig into some data and, and argue with that if they want to. I, I'm not interested in that. So every national championship winner is a great story on some level, but often they just kind of, you know, not maybe not for you, but they just like, oh, yeah, that was that was nice. That was a nice team. They cut the nets. They held the trophy. But they're not always historically relevant national championships. Like you said, whatever happens in this game, however it, it, it ends up, you have something historically relevant. It's either the second time ever that a school that lost to a 16 bounced back and won the national championship the next year. We're either going to get that or more likely, best on the projections, We will have the first back-to-back national champion since 2006, 2007. And I really do think that that even discounts what UConn is doing, as we've talked about before, because 2006, 2007, Florida, Florida, it's nearly the same team with the same coach. It's Billy Donovan with Torian Green and Lee Humphrey and um, Corey Brewer and Al Horford and Joe Kim Noah and it's Walter Hodge coming off the bench and it's Chris Richard coming off the bench. The top seven scores were exactly the same one year to the next. UConn is a largely different team. Three of the top six scores were gone from last season. Um, it, you know, it, 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 I, I, I don't. I don't mean to take anything away from the Florida National Championships, but I do believe in. I, Sounds I, like you, you are. <laughs> I. You, I think the UConn back-to-back would be more impressive than the Florida back-to-back. Yeah, it is. It yeah. is. Yeah. I mean, for a number of reasons. Also, go back and check uh, that Florida run. They had the late seasons, a uh, little bit of a of a dip. They lost like three of their final five, and then they won. Like their their run in the tournament was was pretty impressive. They didn't get caught in a in a tight game late, but uh, UConn's been more dominant overall. Let me just give you a, a couple of nuggets here to set the stage. Um, UConn obviously looking to be the first repeat since Florida. Um, and we, we, we know about the dominance here, but uh, UConn has won its past 11 tournament games by 22.3 points on average. It's the second best ever in a two year span. The best is UCLA in 67, 68 at 22.5. Uh, we, 
UK, UConn's going to need to beat Purdue by 22 plus points. I don't see that happening, but if it did, I mean, look out. Um, UConn is five and zero in national championship games. Purdue is 0-1. It got to there in 69. It was Lou Alcindor's. I believe that was Lou Alcindor's final college game, and he had uh, he had an outrageous stat line. I'll try and uh, pull that up before we get to the end of the show. Um, Purdue has 49 NCAA tournament wins in its program's history. It's more than any other school ever. I think in Zaga, I saw we had a we had a graphic that went up on HQ Saturday night. I think in Zaga's number two on the list, by the way. I think it's got 45. Uh, Big Ten, obviously, looking to win its first national championship since 2000 with Michigan State. It has played in seven title games since Michigan State won in 2000. We'll see if Purdue can end the drought. Um, the uh, the combined NCAA tournament point differential entering this national title game between UConn and Purdue over the past combined. So they've each won five times. So we've, what, a 10 wins plus 223. Uh, that's... Uh, that's the highest ever we've we've seen between two teams going into a title game. There's never been two teams that met on the final night of the season in the national championship that had combined to beat their opponents by more points. A lot of that is obviously UConn, but they also have 70 combined wins. And the only title game that we had with more combined wins uh, with two teams was actually uh, one GP was at in 2008. Kansas and Memphis had 74 combined wins the night of the title game here. Uh, CBS Sports Research tells me UConn Purdue here is at 70, and that was what UConn Duke was with 70 combined wins back in in 1999. Um, it's just it's it's an awesome, awesome, awesome deal. It's the tenth time we've ever seen two one seeds meet for a national championship. That goes back to seeding in '79. The most recent one being obviously Gonzaga versus Baylor. I'd still want what I asked you last night. I don't know if you thought about it. I want to, I want from you the most recent title game going in the matchup that you thought was as good as this one. So get to me uh, shortly on that GP. And then I mentioned this last night, but I'm going to, I'm going to remind everyone the only other time we've had two seven foot starters in a national title game in men's D one or in women's because it has not happened in the women's game either <laughs> uh, was Elijah one versus Ewing 40 years ago in 1984. And it's the first time ever that two players that are seven, two or taller uh, will meet in an NCAA tournament game period. First round, second round, anything has never happened. So those are kind of the the initial stakes around it. Um, and to me, I think this is I think this is the best matchup going in since at least Duke Wisconsin. Gonzaga Baylor was awesome. Trust me, we've had we've actually had a couple of really fantastic title game matchups going in, but. Gonzaga, Gonzaga Baylor, just, I don't know. It, I, I think this one's bigger. And I think it's bigger because of the big men GP, because you get Edie versus Klingon. This does feel like, especially if it's a close game and no matter who wins, um, I don't know, maybe uh, college basketball is always going to have the big man to one. I, I actually appreciate that about the sport, but we've gone 40 years since we saw it. <laughs> maybe we go another 30 years since we, before we see it again, maybe. Uh, but I think that factor is actually something. And I think there's such great potential between these two behemoths battling it out and they're different kind of bigs. Um, so yeah, for me, it's been, it's been a while. I mean, it might be Duke, Wisconsin, but I think I'm more hyped for this one than I was even Duke, Wisconsin, Wisconsin, obviously coming off, knocking off undefeated Kentucky. Duke was freshman late in Krzyzewski late stage of his career. Um, but you tell me when was the last time uh, you thought we had a title game affair that had as much hype and anticipation and, you know, just outright buzz going in like this one. The closest the 21, thing. Well, last one thing, the 21 one, that one right. thing that worked against it, it was in the bubble. Right. So I also think that 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 plays a factor. Had it not been in that, maybe we have a different situation. Okay, so that's the answer because that's the that's the other time where we had one versus two and the, clearly the two best teams in the country all year long and that stuff. But it, it kind of – it was such a weird thing. You know, the, the, the limited fans uh, were still in the middle of a pandemic. It just it, it the whole final four, like what you and I and all of our colleagues did last night, just enjoy each other's company after a long day of work. Like we were not allowed to do that even in Indianapolis. Right. We couldn't do it. It was it was the saddest thing. <laughs> we would get off set in Indianapolis and we'd walk back to our hotel. And it, it was like you so you get all these people in suits and dresses and makeup. And we'd all just walk back to our hotel, like in a line, and we'd all take it. We'd all walk into the liquor store, and everybody, everybody, buy them a bottle for the room, and then we'd all sit upstairs and, and like group chat and Zoom each other. And we had to, we couldn't hang out, so that whole thing was weird. But that's the answer. 
that's that's that you know those were the two best teams in the country and we got them on on the final night of the season i hope this game isn't as lopsided as that game was because that one got out of hand um pretty quickly but if you want to take that and say because you didn't have a stadium filled with fans and it just didn't feel the same i agree i, I think the duke butler game like i was really looking forward to that one just because it was duke like the biggest brand in the sport or at least arguably the biggest brand in the sport. And it's not something I'm interested in arguing about right now um, against Butler from the horizon league in, in Indianapolis. Like hey, the, the Butler guys are going to class on Monday morning and they will be a, you know, in the dome on Monday night, ready to play. I love that one. So, you know, I, I didn't put the list together ranking most anticipated final fours of my 21 years of attending final fours. But this one I think is, is pretty high because again, it's the two best teams. It's the two. It's the best player in the country for the past two years at center at any position, but he's a center, Zach Eady. And then the guy who is probably going to be the first center selected in the 2024 NBA draft, Donovan Klingon. But let's stop here for a second. Do you think that's what decides the game, those two guys? Because I think the game, if it actually – I think if Purdue wins, it's got a lot of Zach Eady in it with some amazing shooting from Braden Smith and Fletcher Lawyer, right? But I, I, if UConn run, if if UConn does what most people think UConn's going to do, which is maybe win a twelfth straight NCAA tournament game by double digits, which is ridiculous, they've won eleven straight NCAA tournament games by double digits. Dan Hurley had an awesome quote. I love how he talks confidently. Um, it's and never really bragging, but just very confident in what they're doing. The, the most recent quote was, "We make a hard tournament look easy." I. I that's what they've been doing it for is. two years now. They've been making a hard tournament look easy. And if they do that again, I actually don't think it'll, that would be decided by Klingon and Edie. I think that's going to – I think if UConn really overwhelms Purdue, where I think it happens is at the one, two, three, they're just bigger and they're more athletic at those positions. And that if, if you're looking – if I'm taking off my – if I'm ripping out my 60% Boilermaker and setting it aside – my biggest concern for Purdue is not how Donovan and Klingon is going to guard Zach Eady. My biggest concern is, buddy, you, you've got pros with size and athleticism on one side in the backcourt and not so much on the other. Will the game be decided by Klingon versus Eady? It is a good question, and it's one I'm going to answer after the break. But first, hey, Nada, Nada, can you can you hear me? Can I get a word from our, Nada? A word from our partners, please. Nada. History. Welcome to March Madness. Oh, you just never know in the tournament who is going to shine. Stream March Madness live on any device, anywhere, and be ready for anything. What's up, up Anderson, Anderson Cooper? Cooper. Anderson. What's up, Anderson Cooper? I learned this the other day. If you if you do a peace sign, yeah, yeah. Okay. Well, now it's not working. Yeah. Now, <laughs> if you're if listening, you, do you have no idea. Whether we look ridiculous right now. Okay. Nothing. Nothing. What up, Anderson way. Cooper? Okay. I actually right, think it's. Answer, I think. Answer, I think. Answer, it, answer the question. I think you need to prompt Anderson Cooper, and that's actually what what causes that's that's the unknown thing. Anyway, I agree with you. I don't think that the matchup decides the game, but I do think it will have heavy influence. <laughs> that's enough, Ferris. Uh, I also I'm. I'm really intrigued to see how if Edie wins the battle definitively or if Klingon can really stay on the floor and handle it. Uh, it's it's just amazing. And, and I interviewed Klingon for HQ last night, and he has so much respect for him. I know I mentioned this briefly on the on the overnight show. And he said, by the way, his hand got a bruise to it. I mean, he's gonna obviously downplay. He said he should be good. We'll see. Hopefully he's good. I want him, I want both these guys at the at full strength there. But, you know, Edie's got, what, two inches on Klingon. He's probably got, I don't have their, uh, probably got 25, maybe 20 pounds on Klingon, maybe 15. It's a, it's a fascinating matchup. I think Edie's going to need to go for, I think Edie's probably got to get, in order for Purdue to have a chance, it's going to have to be more than him. I would say Edie's got to get to at least 26 points and 15 rebounds. And then it's going to have to be the other guys. Like, will they put... Who are they going to have on Braden Smith? He's such such a small guy. Will it be Castle? Will it be Spencer? Braden Smith has got to have a better game. Um, he had a weird game. It was some parts good, some parts not. 
but he's going to have to uh, step up big. Fletcher Lawyer is going to have to shoot well. They're going to need – Purdue's not a deep team. Purdue is going to need to have an A-level game in probably – it might have to get close to what UConn did on Saturday – when it had all five starters at 12 plus points. Um, we'll wait and see on that. Right now in this tournament, Edie is averaging 28 points and 15.4 rebounds per game. You put them together, that is 33 and a half points, or excuse me, 43 and a half points and rebounds per game overall. Um, that's our over under for the title game. Will Edie finish over or under? 43 and a half combined points and boards versus Klingon and UConn on Monday night GP. That's hard. That's just hard, yeah. right? Yeah, I'd say I'd say no. But I don't think he has to. But I I'd, I'd say no. You don't um, I think he's got to dude, I think he's got to be really close to that to give to give Purdue a chance to win. I think he's got to be really close to that number. Yeah, very, I, very could, close. I I could see him close to that number, but I um I I just I We'll see, but I, I don't think that I don't think those two guys are going to decide the game. I don't think they're necessarily going to neutralize each other, but I, I don't think it'll be decided there unless, of course, one of them ends up in foul trouble and, 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 and tied to the bench for long periods of time in the first half. Now, this has been a constant topic of conversation in anticipation of this matchup perhaps materializing is mm -hmm. like UConn's, UConn's not unbeatable, though people do say that all the time. They've been beaten, but but they're hard to beat, and they're especially hard to beat as long as Donovan Klingon is playing real minutes. Um, the way to – if you're trying to neutralize UConn and bring them down to your level, the best way is to try to get that guy off the court. And so the big question is like, what – you know, nobody draws fouls like Zach Eady. Can Zach Eady get Donovan Klingon into foul trouble? Now, the counter to that is that he – Donovan Klingon is almost never in foul trouble. Do you know he's never fouled out in the game? I didn't, but I do now. Yeah. Okay. So now some of that is because it's like in two years of college basketball, Donovan Kling has never fouled out even once. Well, in one year of college basketball, he barely played. All right. Like he played 13 minutes a game. If you're yeah. fouling out in 13 minutes a game, you, there's something wild going on. So he was never going to foul out last season. So we're really only talking about this season, but he, he doesn't get into foul trouble often. Now fouling out it, it is not equal to foul trouble there's a million examples of people getting into foul trouble or the perception of foul trouble without ever fouling out. And he has found himself in those situations. He's had four fouls four times this season, but unless one of them gets in foul trouble, I, I don't think that's where the overwhelming advantage in either direction is. I think if, if we're talking about positional advantages, the most obvious one in this game is going to be on the perimeter because you kind of, again, is just they're bigger and more athletic. And and they're like, you know, Tristan Newton's a pro. Uh, Stefan Castle is obviously a pro, maybe a top yeah. 10 pick. And Purdue has really nice college players in its backcourt, but they don't have that. They don't. They don't. And they, those guys, I mean, Lawyer's the one that's got a little something to him. Maybe we get a little uh, little trash talk between Lawyer and Cam Spencer. We'd love to see it because Lawyer's the one that really brings that energy and that kind of attitude and confidence. They're going to need it for sure from him. And he, is, he has been a better – a better player uh, um, uh, and a different guy versus what he was two months ago, which has been important. Um, he kind of helped set the tone. And in, in, in a regular game on Saturday, uh, Lawyer has gotten to double figures in the past four games, 15 against Utah State, only 10 against Gonzaga, uh, but did hit a couple of threes. And he had he had 14 against uh, Tennessee and 11 against NC State, but his 11 felt big. They're going to need him to play well. Obviously, Braden Smith's got to keep the turnovers down. The turnovers are going to be a huge thing. They've got to keep it down. Purdue, we know the fouling deal. Keep an eye on that. They they, they don't foul. Um, we've got a really – by the way, we have a really good crew working the game, as, as is always the case, but this is like a stellar, stellar crew uh, led by Roger Ayers that's working the game on Monday night. So uh, they'll be ready. They'll be prepared. Purdue, I will remind our audience – is an excellent three-point shooting team. It makes 40.6% of its of its triples there. That's number two in the country. UConn doesn't doesn't exceed from three, although it shot better from three. Uh, shot had uh, had more volume and made more than Bama. Bama had the better percentage on Saturday night. 36%. UConn gets it done on, in the interior. It's the best per points per possession offense in the country. UConn is. Um, and a lot of that's because of the damage that it can do down low. And frankly, a lot of what Tristan Newton does as well. So. Purdue is going to need to 
have contributions from all five. I, I wonder if like a Miles Colvin can come off the bench. And, and sometimes we get this in a Final Four, a national title game. A role player finds himself because of a matchup or one thing or another, suddenly contributing 8, 10, 12 points in a spot we haven't seen most of the season. A really good athlete. Let's see if they if if he's used in that stage, if he's ready for that stage. Um, because Purdue has now played out. I'll, I'll point out that Purdue, it didn't play a great game against NC State. And it, uh, it didn't play its best game against Tennessee. Now, it won both those games. A sign of a really, really good team is you can win in a variety of styles and you can have a bad game and you can still win easily. We just saw that last night. But it, it that that needs to stop. Like, it's not going to keep – it's not going to be a close game if the Purdue we've seen in the past couple of games after cruising to the regional final, if that team shows up on Monday, then it's lights out. I mean, it's going to be UConn that wins by double digits there. So I would keep that in mind as well. Edie's going to have to to be a star. Um We'll see if he plays 40 minutes again. He played 40 on Saturday. I don't I don't think he can do that again. I mean, last game of his college career. I don't know. I, why why don't you think so? I know like do you want like being in the building? Yeah. You can see things that you don't see on TV. Like he like he's he's back and forth nonstop, but it's like this. <laughs> Harris is just waving his hand across it. again for our, for our podcast. <laughs> they're like, they're it, like, he's like, what, Parrish? Yeah, exactly. And like, I, is UConn going to make him move a little faster than he than he likes to move? Yeah, probably. I mean, I, I would imagine. I mean, UConn, but they're not. They're not a. They're not. They, they can get out and go, but that's not their bread and butter. I right. Mean, it's, it's more the, the actions that they run and and the way that they they play their offense is just a. It's very different. Um, you know. What I mean is uh, there's been a, a, a constant in this NCAA tournament where people go into the game saying, you've got to make Zach Eady work on the defensive end of the court. you got to make him guard. you got to make him play. And consistently, teams aren't, ma aren't making him uncomfortable on that end of the court and making him move around in ways that you probably need to make him move around and pull him away from the basket. I think UConn is going to make him – they're going to make him play on that end of the court, and that's – that 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 could that that could prove difficult. Um, I I I obviously Edie's got to be good. I think the most the more important thing. Purdue is a great three point shooting team. I think they have to be a great three point shooting team in this game. I don't think it's one of those where they can shoot twenty nine percent from three and win. They're going to have to make shots from the perimeter because obviously scoring at the rim against UConn is is tough. So that's like keep an eye on on those numbers and honestly keep an eye on UConn's three point shooting too. Because, again, this team is hard to beat, but not unbeatable. They've been beaten three times. Now, one of the losses was at Kansas, and basically everybody loses at Kansas. That's almost a scheduled loss. I know Dan wouldn't think of it that way, but when you schedule a non-league game at Allen Fieldhouse, like you're, you know, you're up against it. So, right. like th that game is whatever. I don't even care. I, I, I think nothing differently. Well, like I don't care about that result. Let's look at the other two. And if you look at the other two, the first thing you have to realize is. All of them were road games, and they're not playing a road game, so they've never lost a neutral court or a home game. But the other one, the the common denominator, it just on a very basic level, against Creighton in that loss, they shot below twenty percent from three. Against Seton Hall in that loss, below twenty percent from three. So they have when they've gotten caught, and it's rare, but it has been environments where they're outnumbered from a fan perspective. And they shot below 20% from three. And they're going to be outnumbered from a fan perspective tomorrow, you think, and I agree. And if they have an off-night shooting, that uh, you know, that could be the type of thing that, obviously, for Purdue to win, it's going to have to be an upset. And I, I think this is true. If UConn plays at its level, it's hard to beat them. They, they, and Purdue probably won't. But, you know, UConn is capable of not playing to that level. And that is how you get a, at least theoretically, that's how you could you could after 40 minutes of basketball see Purdue with more points than UConn. Uh with that in mind and knowing that we are going to talk about this again on TV uh before the title game Monday and we got media availability later today so we'll have a little more to talk about and react to based on what gets said today. You want to uh just offer up our our picks and scores and our 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 mop projection here before we get out of here? Well, sure, why not? I think people know where I'm at. Um and earlier, you know, I pointed out that though the point spread is six and a half. The Ken Palm projection is only 75-72. It's only three. And I was looking at the chat, 
And uh, Shadi has pointed out that the Ken Palm line is basically just efficiency difference adjusted for. Thanks, Shadi. I'm, I'm well aware of what that is. E extra ducks four. Um, at the risk of trusting extra ducks four, which I know is like, but just I'm gonna trust you, extra ducks four. That person said, uh, the Torvik line is Yukon 2.8, Massey Ooh. line is Yukon 2.5, and the BPI is Yukon minus one and a half. So every computer has That's this. Right. Every computer has this much closer than the actual betting markets have it, for whatever reason. The obvious reason being because UConn's beating the hell out of everybody. Um, but the computers do – the point I was trying to make earlier, and this is just true, you do not usually see point spreads in the betting markets this dramatically different from a Ken Palm projection unless there are injuries involved. So this is a unique situation, which, um, you know – I. I if you're a Purdue fan, you shouldn't love that the betting markets are begging everybody to take Purdue, all right? Because that's what they're doing. And uh, that's usually a sucker's play. But I've, I've been here for a long time, and it, okay. it, would seem, it would seem silly to move off of it now. I will take Purdue. Give me a score. Let's, I'm going to give you a score right now. You ready for this score? Yep, let's we're go. Gonna, we're we're going to call it 72 to 71 mm. Purdue over UConn in the national championship game. Do you want to go mop now or you want to go save the mop for tomorrow's show? I feel like maybe let's maybe save it. Let's save it for tomorrow. Although yours is obviously it's going to be easy if you're picking Purdue to win. Um, I'm, I, 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 I'm, I might. What if Fletcher Lawyer knocks down six threes? You know, what if? <laughs> um, uh, between last night's poll and today's, although the same number of people didn't vote, so this isn't exact, but I'm going to take the split the difference. Um, 61% of our live viewers have picked UConn to win. That's uh that's lower than I would have thought. So 61 to 39 split. UConn winning this game versus Purdue. Uh our projections and predictions are going to be up at cbsports.com as well. I will take I'm going to stick with what I said. I'm going to pick UConn to win and I'm going to pick UConn to win by double digits until I see a team catch UConn in a close game. Be clear about two things here. Purdue can absolutely get this game close. And I desperately want to cover a close national title game on Monday. I want to see UConn in a tight game. I want to see UConn sweat. I want to see it in doubt with under four minutes to go. Please give me that. I want to see it so desperately. But haven't seen it yet until I see it. I'm not picking it. This is the last opportunity. I'm still not going to pick it. I'm going to give it double digits by the narrowest margin. I'm going to go UConn 80, Purdue 70, Huskies back-to-back cement their status among the all-time legends in the history of the sport. All right. All right. I got to go be on TV. You got to go talk to coaches and players, right? And then I got to do HQ. So that is that is correct. It's a hell of a day. It's a hell of a day. But it's good to see you again. Good to see you. Good to see we you gotta, again. We, we, we got to get out of here. You almost went to the hospital. Maybe we save that one for Sunday. Yeah, you look at me, though. Oh, buddy, I bounced back good. well. I You're bounced good. back so strong. Look at me. Can't hold me down. That's right. I mean, maybe. I mean, yeah, I mean, you can for like 36 hours or so. You can get me down for about 36 hours, but that's as long. I bounce back every time. Shouts to Devin Downey. Shouts to Chester, South Carolina. Shouts to Terry M. F. and Teagle. That's a legend. Huck Larnell. Thank you guys once again for watching the Island College Basketball Podcast. More of us than there are of them. That's right. Always. Don't forget, if you're not subscribed, please go subscribe. A lot of us is out here in Phoenix, Spotify. by the way. A lot of us. Go subscribe. And if you're not subscribed to the CBS Sports College Basketball YouTube channel. Please knock that out while you're here. We'll talk to you again on Monday on CBS Sports Network. Till then, take care.